Welcome back to Design Futures. The future is now. Currently, it's 4 p.m. and in just a while, we will begin with the afternoon and evening sessions. But before we get into that, I want to check again with you guys. We have another icebreaker coming, so in a few seconds, we'll be flashing a QR code on the screen. Scan that for me, and you can also log on to the website for our word cloud and question for the session. So again, you can see the QR code, but you can also log into the website. That's www.menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and use the code 5064805. So you can do that, log into menti.com, and you can use the code 5064805. Okay, I can see the QR code, and I'm sure a lot of you are scanning it right now. So the question for this afternoon for our word cloud is, what do you miss the most about life before the pandemic? Uh, I believe the lockdowns began March 2020 and we're one of the longest lockdowns of the world. We're approaching two years now. So what is it the most you miss about life before the pandemic? Personally, I miss those genuine connections that we enjoy over coffee or we enjoy with our friends as we have a long trip together outside the city. You know, it's these little things. I see your answer. Somebody said you miss dining out, travel, beach. Yes, all of these things. It's difficult to do safely and with a peace of mind because of the pandemic. Yes, I'm seeing more and more answers. That's great. So I'm also seeing dinner with friends, <laughs> walking in a yellow triangle. That is oddly specific, but you know, if it's real and it's personal, then it's true to you. Great, more and more answers. And I know on Facebook, people are also commenting their answers, but we're right here on menti.com if you want to join our word cloud over here. And now I have another question. So we were just looking back. Now I'd like to ask something that relates to the future. So what is it that you miss the most? Oh, no, no, sorry. So the question is, what do you look forward to in the future? What is it that you look forward to post-pandemic, in the coming months, in the coming years. Personally speaking, again, I really look forward to meeting the people who I've created online relationships with, such as some of the co-workers who I've never even met in person, you know? And I just wonder how different the dynamics would be. But it doesn't mean I don't look forward to building that friendship and building on that relationship and that connection. So I see some of your answers. You guys look forward to being in a safer place to live in. Street food trips, yes. Um, we also have universal healthcare, all things that are important. Being COVID free, not having any of that fear or that uncertainty when we go out. And being able to hug friends and loved ones. This is so, so true. Who would have thought that something as simple and as basic as physical touch would be something we'd have to limit ourselves to? We're in the pandemic and it's weird times indeed. I'm seeing more and more answers and it's great being able to know you guys on this deeper, more personal level. Oh, here we go. Face-to-face -face class, physical parties, face-to-face -face meetings. So I guess what I'm reading, what I'm hearing is you miss those opportunities to be in a room with people, exchange ideas physically and not have to do it over Zoom. <laughs> or Google Meet. I know it's a different experience, but we make do with what we have. And I am proud of how everyone is coping with the times that we live in now. Okay, so thank you for answering those two questions very honestly. Next up, we have a poll question for you. And the first question is, which sectors future are you most curious about? I know we have different guests here today and not everybody comes from the same sector. So the question is, which sector's future are you most curious about? We have four options, namely A, food, B, fashion, C, creative industries, or D, healthcare. So you can go on ahead and log in your answer. So this one, I believe it's for Facebook. So which sector's future are you most curious about? You can also see the choices on screen. It's A, B, C, D food, fashion, creative industries, and healthcare. My answer would be fashion, just listening to the talk given earlier. 
and how we can shift to more sustainable options. That's something I'm finding myself more and more interested in. You might feel the same way, you might not. It's really up to you, but go ahead and log in your answers. And with that, we do have... Oh, we'll log in those answers and we'll check back in a few minutes with the results. I will also want you guys to see the different responses and see your answers reflected on screen, but we'll get to that later. So while you do that, let me talk about our next sessions for this afternoon. And I promise you, they are so, so exciting and also very insightful. Our next session is a Pecha Kucha. And the question naturally is, what is a Pecha Kucha? Pecha Kucha started in Tokyo in 2003, designed by architects Astrid Klein and Mark Dytham. It is a presentation format also known as the 20 by 20 presentation. That means 20 slides only for 20 seconds each. It's sort of like a sprint challenging our speakers to share their ideas in a succinct and strong manner for a more captivating presentation. After the Pecha Kucha, make sure you stay because we have a virtual tour with HK Walls and Scooney projects of Disconnect. Disconnect is a radical exhibition that brings together technology and art to reflect the current social conditions and provide emotional, mental, and spiritual sustenance. I'm just making sure that we're all good with our poll questions. You guys have answered? I believe so. Okay. And we will we'll end the night later on with a film documentary of Chasing Coral, a deep dive into life below the ocean, discovering the environmental effects of the global heat wave and climate crisis. Stick around for this one because we have the opportunity to chat with the founder and CEO of the Ocean Agency, Richard Vevers, right before the show. So make sure you stick around for that. So it's a packed night for design futures. There's definitely a lot to look forward to in the future, which is why it's all the more important to think about what we can do today. It's something to ponder on, right? And while we're on the topic, our Pecha Kucha presentations might help keep this frame of mind going. So are you all ready? I assume and I believe the answer is yes. As I mentioned earlier, Pecha Kucha is a presentation format that empowers our speakers to be concise and focused with only 20 slides and 20 seconds per slide. Pecha Kucha is Japanese and it translates to the sound of conversation or chit chat. Much like a haiku, a Pecha Kucha enables the speaker to be as creative as possible in a contained format which often produces amazing results. For today's Pecha Kucha, we have two presenters. We have Nina Tirol of Talino Venture Labs and her presentation, The Future of Fintech is Inclusive. And we also have interior designer Ken Perolino of Space Project on The Future of Interior Design in Iloilo. Remember, if you have any questions to our presenters, if you have any sentiments or reactions during their talk, note them down, comment, or send it over via our platform so we can pull them up later in our fireside chat. We encourage questions, we encourage your feedback and your insights. So with that, let's welcome them to the IDC stage. Our first presenter is interior designer Ken Perolino, then immediately followed by Nina Terol. So, hi, I am Ken Perolino, interior designer from the Iloilo Panay chapter and uh, currently managing space project. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll just share my story on how I got into interior design. Way back in my pre-college days, uh, my mother asked me to take the courses. Uh, she told me with the schools uh, she mentioned, Asian parents deciding for your future, and then when you fail because of their decision, it's all your fault. But kidding aside. I just said yes and went to other universities and took the ent entrance exam. I got accepted from the three schools and I chose uh, University of San Agustin, Iloilo. Most of my friends are there and I li literally don't have any idea what interior design was, but then with a little explanation from one of the faculty members, I still didn't get it. 
And uh, I told my friends I took BS Interior Design. I thought it was easy and I could graduate easily and become homeless afterwards. Uh, I told my mother I'm enrolled with a new course called Interior Design. And as a young adult, it was a bit difficult since my parents' uh, ideas are not aligned with mine. After I passed the board exam, I started practicing here in Manila and that's where the true work begins. Ergonomics and anthropometrics were my best buddies during my junior interior designer days. One day, my former, uh, one day, my former boss told me to attend a client meeting without any type of brief. We were like dropsmen. I just followed the instruction and met the client at a designated meeting place, and I thought it was just a casual meeting. Well, it was casual, but then I was not informed that the client was one of the ABS CBN executives. So I was uh, wearing shorts at that time, and uh, for me, it was a lesson learned and always wear pants at client meetings. So little did I know that the client would like to design a restaurant, which I have no experience yet during that time. I'm not prepared for the questions thrown at me during the meeting, and I was a bit embarrassed not knowing what they were talking about. Good thing the client helped me out, understanding the kitchen and restaurant design. After that embarrassing phase of my budding career, I decided to put extra effort in all of my projects. The project architect was also helping me with the plans, and the project made me understand the role of functionality in, in other aspects. Uh, functionality is the measurement of whether a design is successful or not. The first time I heard functionality was during my college days without understanding the full context of it. I went back to Iloilo, supervised one project, and checked the progress of the construction under Futura. That was 2017, and at that time, there were only few interior designers in Iloilo, and people tend to hire interior designers from Manila because of the lack of awareness within the community. These concerns were recognized by the Philippine Institute of Interior Designers, Panay Chapter, Board of Trustees, where social media accounts were made to raise awareness that there are interior designers in Iloilo. With the booming economy of Iloilo, it was easily bought and locals were aware of the project, which I successfully landed one client. Infographics were also released to the public via social media platforms to create awareness about the role of the interior designer in the construction industry and why uh, they should not take it for granted. The initiative of the Iloilo LG Consulting Design Professionals for the development of the province has affected the lives and livelihood of the people. The Esplanade was being constructed at that time and national media has been recognizing works of design studios companies like Living Design Innovations Limited, uh, Space Project Interior Design Services, Vitrine, and La Hubre for their contribution and value of design with, with their residential and, and institutional projects. Now, locals see the value of interior design and its aspect, not just for residential, but for the business sector as well. An interior design that is according to the client's preference is an esteem need. Esteem need can be referred to Maslow's hierarchy of need. Uh, to refresh our minds, Maslow is an American psychologist and philosopher, but best known for his self-actualization theory of psychology, which argued that the primary goal of psych psychotherapy should be in the integration of the self. Uh, esteem needs are the fourth level in Maslow's hierarchy and include self-worth, accomplishments, and respect. Uh, Maslow classified esteem needs into two categories. One is esteem for oneself, Dignity, achievement, mastery, and independence. Next is the, the desire for reputation or respect from the others, especially status and prestige. In exchange for our services, our aim is to satisfy our client. With this growth, Ilongo interior designers are in demand, not just in Iloilo, but in the whole country. Showcasing their prowess with their appropriate design approach, making the built environment design safe and unique. La Hubre, for example, used a design-driven innovation approach of cycling materials like broken glass and retaining window grills. They are trying to find value and meaning to innovate materials and spaces. Space Project, on the other hand, uses utilitarian design approach and modern minimalist as design style. Prioritizing and maximizing the function of spaces, providing a feeling of ample space and good workflow. Design is not just about the emotional aspect, but it's a solution to the unforeseen problems that might occur. Then pandemic came. Everybody shifted to 
digital platforms uh, to deliver and connect businesses. Adjusting to pandemic is never easy. Although we've been doing our businesses digitally, the paradigm shift to the construction industry challenges the existing norms. Making use of the technology was a big help to some, but burdened the others. The digital platform has a lot to offer. It opens another door of, of opportunity and career, especially to us. It gave us time to study and understand digital marketing and social media management. We shifted to online meeting and online consultations, consultations to reach our clients. Despite uncertainties, the future of interior design in the province is creative. I think we're having a little bit of technical difficulty. I believe Miss Nina is currently on mute. But while we figure that out and troubleshoot it, you know, this is what I love about Pecha Kucha. It is the creative platform for creative people to talk about creative things. And it's interesting to finally see it online because I've attended a few talks and it is a different experience. But I'm so interested with what our speakers have to say, what Nina has to say and share with all of us, given that 20 second time frame per slide. And I know it's going to be something of interest to all of us. Again, if you have any questions, any comments, feedback, or even your personal takeaways and insights, you can use our platform to comment or share. We're also live on Facebook as many of you are watching through the live stream. So don't be shy at all, go ahead and sound off. And we will try our best to get to all of the questions as we go along. We're just waiting for the audio to come back on, I believe. So this is just a reminder and an invitation for our guests who might have just come in now or a few minutes ago. But don't leave after the Pecha Kucha because we have a film screening and also the opportunity to talk with the people who created it. We have Chasing Coral in the evening. So make sure you stay tuned for that. All right, here we go. I believe Nina is back with us, and it's time for her to take the virtual stage with her Pecha Kucha presentation. This is where we do the virtual applause. Okay. Hi, everyone. Sorry about that earlier. I'm Nina. I'm Chief Marketing Officer of Talina Venture Labs. I'll tell you more about it in a bit. Um, I also won't go through all the logos you see here, but I've had over 20 years of experience in the communication space. Very happy to now be in the tech sector, and I'll be sharing uh, some ideas that designers will be interested in. So I represent Talina Venture Labs. It's a global venture studio for inclusive fintech a lot of buzzwords there but basically a venture studio is a startup that builds other startups we specialize in inclusive fintech technologies and we operate in the philippines in the united states in bahrain and the middle east and we'll tell you a bit more about why we're here you know the world has a 5.2 trillion dollar financial inclusion gap affecting 1.7 billion people around the world this impacts who gets to go to school get health care borrow money get a job pay their bills afford a home keep a job take care of family afford anything and this is why we're super passionate about what we do and that's why we want to share um, this excerpt from global finance i'll pause here so that you can read the quote
you know, financial exclu exclusion hurts people. And that's why it's part of our mission at Talino Venture Labs to make sure that people in underserved markets get access to financial access, financial services that they really need. And we believe that the future of fintech is and should be inclusive. So here I'll show some case studies of work we've done and also some examples. But pop quiz, when you think of fintech, let us know what you think. So you can also type in the comments, but some first things that come to mind would be a smartphone, an e-wallet, credit cards, online payments, right? If there's anything else you think of, please type in the comment section. But what if you live in a place with no signal or no electricity, or you're a senior and not so comfortable with technology, or you live in a rural area with very limited access, or you don't have a smartphone, or what if you simply don't understand how things work? Now think about that for a minute and think about that um, for the people around you who experience that. So as designers, our job is to develop solutions that offer the right answers to the right problems for the right people. It's never about what we want or what we think alone is best, but what is best for the people we serve. So here, um, please allow me to take you through some case studies and some lessons we learned along the way. So the first is Nanay. This was developed by our InsurTech Saffron. It's an agent platform for our Nanay agents to be able to um, digitize online uh, you know, forms of insurance um, forms very quickly. So instead of filling out papers, they just scan something through their smartphones and it eases their jobs. So from three hours of encoding a day down to a few minutes. We learned that when you're designing a product, you consider the context of the product. Who's using it? How? How are the nanas using a product? How do they deal with camera phones? Um, how are the forms being designed? How do they write on the forms? We had to design for a complete experience and design the app, the forms, and train the nanas. Another platform we developed is Tita Susi ng Asen. So it's our micro loan chatbot developed with um, Card MRI, the largest microfinance institution in the Philippines. So she helped our clients on board and apply for their loans much faster. Our clients love Tita Susi so much, they actually went to the branch and asked to meet her in person. Lessons learned never assume that an app is the best possible solution. Sometimes great solutions can come from platforms we use every day, like Facebook Messenger, which our nanas use every day. And to design an inclusive solution, you have to make it super easy for the least tech savvy person in the room. And sometimes it's the nanas in our own families. Relief Agad was a platform we developed at the height of the pandemic um, to help families who were receiving the ayuda. So um, this was something we developed with the DSWD and the USAID. And we even mobilized hundreds of volunteers to make sure that we could deploy this app as quickly, as cleanly, and as securely as possible. We learned that when you're designing solutions in crisis mode, you have to engage ecosystems. And we're super grateful for our volunteers for stepping up. You have to complement your solutions with easy to understand customer communications. And you'll see that in their Facebook page. And ease of use is the holy grail to get to easy customer adoption. Now, Tijara is a platform we developed with the Bahrain Development Bank. So this is the first and only digital SME lending platform for small businesses in the Middle East who were hard hit by the pandemic. A lot of lessons here because we built everything and convened the team in the middle of the pandemic, worked remotely across you know, time zones. And we had to learn that understanding the cultural context of whom you're designing for is very important. We can never make assumptions. We had to consider the workflow of designing for multiple languages. I mean, here in the Philippines, we do have a lot of languages too. So something to keep in mind. And do not ever take right to left layout for granted. Other um, is NAAC and Talino. So this was something that we developed very recently with the National Asian American Coalition. We took the Grameen Bank model and uh, what we learned in Card uh, Bank uh, using the social lending circles and digitized that for low and medium uh, income individuals in the US. And we learned that develop, you know, here in the developing world, we do have so many solutions. We don't always just have to import solutions, but we can also export solutions to other economies. This solution won the market readiness category in the FDIC tech sprint called Breaking Down Barriers Reaching the Last Mile of the Unbanked by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. So what are we saying? There are big problems out there. When we're talking about financial inclusion, we want to be able to um, design in a way that dive out of our comfort zones, we need to think inside a box, think in terms of our limitations. We need to dream boldly, execute tightly, and always stay grounded on our why.
We invite you to please engage with us at talinolabs.com. You can also find us on Instagram, um, on Facebook, of course. And if you want to reach out to me or even apply for a job, please check out our website and do um, message careers at talinolabs.com. So thank you so much and see you at the fireside chat. Hi, Ken. Hi, Nina. Hello. Amazing work. Thank you for sharing yes. those Pecha Kucha presentations with us. Go ahead. You can take your sip of water <laughs> because we are moving to a super interesting part of our program. And of course, this is going to be the question and answer portion, otherwise known as our, our fireside chat. So we've received some questions in our inbox and via Zoom for you. Our moderator, Andre Yap, will be guiding you through the fireside chat. Andre is the chairman and CEO of Ignite House of Innovations, which invests and operates in venture capital, technology, media, and education, among others. Andre has built Ignite House to be an innovator for innovators, with the vision of establishing the Filipino as a uniquely disruptive force in global innovation. He is also serving as the executive chairman of NI2, the Philippines National Innovators Initiative to power 100,000 Filipino innovators by 2023. NI2 is a public-private partnership with national and local governments, and it is a business and nonprofit with also business and nonprofit organizations and the academe. So, welcome to the IDC stage, Andre. Hello. Pleasant, very pleasant. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, Kayla, thank you for the warm introduction and for the awesome hosting. Inya. Yes, Inya and, and I Dr. got my Ken. wine. Dr. Ken, cheers to both of you. Cheers yes, to both cheers. Of you. Okay, listen, since we're virtual, let me start this off by saying... <laughs> Bravo, right? Uh, yeah. Well done. Uh, I'm here. My job is easy because I'm just watching you guys sweat it out, although I don't think you guys uh, broke a sweat. So uh, how about this? We have uh, Kayla, I believe, uh, the better part of until 5 o'clock no? for our fireside chat. Yeah? Yes, we have the time for the Q&A and the fireside chat right now. Okay, so uh, let's manage our time. We have until 5. And my job really is to be the advocate of the audience here. No? So... Uh, I will apply a little bit of human-centered design thinking in the way we conduct the fireside chat so that it's not just a... I mean, normally, I mean, I spent 15 years in the U.S. and I've had quite a few fireside chats, literally. And they tend to be meandering all over the place, really nice with good wine, if you have the whole night. We don't. We only have 25 minutes up to 5 o'clock. So what's our human-centered design thinking objective up to 5 o'clock? We want to take the wonderful stories of Nina and Dr. Ken that they shared with us. We want to deep dive into them enough so that they, we can dig up the relevance to each of us as we sit in our home offices, in our real offices, in our living rooms, perhaps as we enjoy happy hour. And then we want to walk out at 5 o'clock. Um, Perhaps with a meaningful, not just understanding, but, but with meaningful resolve as to we learn something here and we're going to apply it, whatever we do. That's the challenge for all of us. Are you guys up to the challenge? Sure. Oh, yeah. Let's drink Perfect. to that. Perfect. So, did you say we're going to drink to that? Grab yes. a drink. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have coffee with me. Okay. So, uh, Ken, I suppose you're in Iliilo? No, I'm in Makati right now. Oh man, you, you ruined the charm. It would have been like nice. <laughs> yeah, because oh. yes, because most of my recent projects are here in Manila now. So okay. yeah. And Nina is coming to us live via where? Um from Manila as well. Yeah, so I'm in Quezon City, Kayla's where? Mm -hmm. I guess I'm representing the province. I'm in Bacola de Negros Occidental. There you go. Uh <laughs> The almost Ilongo, uh, Iluilo Ken, <laughs> is now replaced by Kayla in Bacolod. Well, hello to a lot of good friends in Bacolod, no? Um, it's always good to get a sense of place. That's why I started with that for a fireside, no? Um, Ken and uh, Nina uh, presented uh, a lot of visionary uh, 
images and stories and sharings. Now, what, what, what we want to do is ground it in the day-to-day -day realities of our audience today. And I want to start that off with some real personal stories that I want to draw out of each of you. No? Oh, sorry, um, Andre, to be interrupting. But also, you mentioned grounding. And yeah. I hope you don't mind, just so that we give this fireside chat a little bit more context, we are actually going to display some of the poll answers from earlier. I guess we Perfect. can do that right now. Yeah, so you can start start with a mini workshop or whatever it is you want to do right after. Okay. So, okay. so what I wanted to ask uh, um, Minya and uh, Dr. Ken is, we have a balance probably in our audience of interior designers and other design professionals or design providers on the provider side. Same with Nina on the fintech side. And they're mm -hmm. probably interested in that particular perspective of what can I do better as a designer, as an interior designer, as a fintech professional. So you're on the sort so-called supply side, right? But then mm -hmm. we have the better part of our audience, which I would call the demand side or the perspective demand side, which is well, I don't really care about fintech, or I don't really care about interior design, or I might, and I'm on the I'm on the customer side. So I want to fish out from you your most favorite stories about your fields and your disciplines, what you shared with us. And they're your favorite because they bring together, they collide the perspective of the provider side and the customer side. And and it and, and the story, the story that you will share with us made it real to you, the humanity of what you're doing, right? So let's take it out of the ether of, of high-minded fintech, global fintech. Now, everybody mm -hmm. says fintech, it's a buzzword. I don't yeah. really know what it means anymore. Interior design, yeah, I'm not really into it. My wife's into it. And, you know, um, what is your story where your life as a provide on the provider side, boom, met and made a difference. And in particular, the story is on the, on the customer side. What difference did you make in their lives? Make it real for us. Let's start with Nina. And I'll get the storytelling uh, off by saying you, 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 you brought up a lot of wonderful case studies. The one that pops mm -hmm. into your mind because it's very easy. And we all know it is Nanai. Nanai, yes. Nanai right? Yep. Um, but still, I want your personal encounter, Nina. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not, might, yeah. Might, might be like, tell us. Yeah. Go ahead. No, definitely. Um, I'll actually talk about uh, Tita Susi. It's one of my favorite. Um, but uh, we actually worked on Nana and Tita Susi at the same time, and it involved a deep immersion into the community where our um, customers, our target customers, live. So we lived with them, ate with them, you know, experienced water shortage with them uh, for a few days to really understand what the customers were going through. So deep dive immersion to know that this is their daily life. Therefore, this is how they're going to use the product. So just set, uh, fast forward, when we were um, really figuring out the platform, we knew that it couldn't be a downloadable app because they were really having bandwidth problems, you know, signal problems, etc. It had to be in a platform. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yes. sorry. Let's remind our audience, Tita Susi was to do what for who? Oh, yes. Yeah. So Tita Susi, um, she's called Tita Susi ng Ascenso, literally, the key to your success or key to progress. She's a micro loan chat bot. So we developed that uh, with our partner, Card MRI, and that was uh, a chat bot that they used so that members... Uh, could apply for loans just by engaging with Tita Susi on Facebook Messenger. I mean, it was yeah, quite yeah. revolutionary. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's that's really nice. I, I kind of get it now. Now, who's actually providing the loans? So the partner, Card MRI, they're the ones who provide the loans. They have nice. members. So you need to be a member to be able to apply for a loan. And uh, so they this, use... Mm -mm. The Tita, Tita Susi effectively becomes the loan application process. Yes. Mm -mm. Because... Then, equivalent to me walking into a bank filling in the application process waiting and all that yes Beautiful. in our context yes but in their context what usually happens is they have a loan officer they have to physically meet uh, through a center meeting it's like in a small community meeting they fill out a form you know manually through a, an account officer or a loan officer. And typically, a loan officer is like a tita, you know, very charming and bubbly and friendly. So we modeled the chatbot after one of the friendly account officers, and we called her Tita Susie. And that's also how we built the chatbot. How would Tita Susie talk to somebody on Facebook Messenger as if, you know, they were just magkumare and somebody's applying for a loan? And, uh, and again, it worked so 
well because they engaged with Tita Susi so much. There was actually somebody who went to the center and said, uh, Nasan po si Tita Susi? Where is Tita Susi? I want to be able to meet her. Um, and to me, the most touching moment, you know, after having worked on the app backstage, when we were finally testing it, you know, it would often take these nanas a few days to maybe a week or more to be able to get their loans. From the time they started the app till the time they actually physically held cash in their hands, it took them an hour. And I really wanted to cry. I had tears just observing the process and seeing this is the impact it could have on a nanas life. Instead of waiting for a week or more for your funds, you could get it in an hour through something that you use every day. So to me, that was mind blowing. Indeed, it's mind blowing. <laughs> Indeed, I have I have the full range of sound effects, right? No, that's that's wonderful. Make it a bit more real for our audience, Nina. Mm -hmm. This is the tech thing. What did that nana who got her loan? in one hour as opposed to mm -hmm. several days. And you know, several days in the context of that life. Yes. It's several days of anxiety. Yes. It's several days of stress. It's several days of pause. We, yes. we know that one of the most hated things in life is not knowing where you stand, right? Mm -hmm. So you made a difference in that sense. What did this nanai or this um, micro uh, borrower do with the funds? Do you have, mm -hmm. can you give us a, what do they typically do? With, yeah, with typically, they use it uh, as revolving capital for their sari sari stores. So uh, a lot of these nanas they run sari sari stores. You need to buy extra supplies that you can sell yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. So the loan amounts at the time around five thousand pesos, but that was enough for her to buy more supplies that she could sell the next day. No, five 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 thousand pesos is a lot of new inventory that you can keep your your suki customers coming oh, yeah. every day. You no, know? otherwise they'll go somewhere else and you lose that. Wonderful mm -hmm. story, Nina, and I'm glad it made it brought you to tears. I think that the true test, one of the true tests of effective design is when it brings people to tears because it touched something deep within. We're not it, we're not there for the dramatic flair. It touched something mm -hmm. deep within. And that's a testament of great design. So uh thank you for that. Oh uh Ken, tell us about your tear jerker story about interior design. Yeah, uh Basically, I, I'm not sure if I have that kind of tear jerking story, but uh, I'll share something uh, parang maiba lang. Uh, actually, my parents are not really supportive when I took interior design, but I fell in love with interior design when I'm pr uh, practicing it here na in Manila. Uh, what's uh, interesting about interior design is that we, we were taught that uh, interior design is about materials, specification, and space planning. But it's beyond that. You need to uh, empathize with your client because you need to have that connection uh, with your client so that you can create a design that is uh, human-centered and that is really uh, custom to their usage. So uh, it started with the restaurant design project uh, under Casa Dasa. So my client, yeah, based on what I've shared, it was the ABS Seven executives, uh, one of the ABS Seven executives. Uh, Meeting, so I was quite uh, a bit shocked at that moment. But but then later on, we tried to collaborate with each other, and that's the time I realized that interior design it really matters to the space planning, from kitchen to the workflow of the customers in the restaurant. It matters. So after that, I got referrals uh, when they say that oh your your work is really good at that moment, and that's the time that I I think I. I dig deeper or understand more what interior designs can do to help uh, our clients use the space that, uh, space that they want. So after that, uh, that's the time that I get referrals from, from, from that client. And uh, now I'm currently focusing on uh, residential designs. So I moved on from commercial to residential. And uh, what's the best thing about residential design is that you're creating a space for a family. So when creating a space for a family, I don't really understand the context because uh, I, 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 I'm not really aware how interior design works when I was in college. It, I, I was taught that it's just space planning and material specification and what, just to make things beautiful or make it uh, aesthetically pleasing. Well, now it's not that. I appreciate that I, I took this course and now I understand uh, the, the, the way how interior design works. 
So there must be a connection with the client and the designer for them to create a space that is uh, safe, healthy, and uh, yeah, safe and healthy for 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 the client to for the client to use. So I think that's that's more of my story, but tear jerking. But it's more of the appreciation of how the profession uh, can provide to society. You know, wonderful, Ken, because your your topic, after all, is about the future of design, right? Yes. And I think if you're really listening, you just zeroed in on one of the most glaring, obvious gaps in the future mm -hmm. of design. And it is the way this interior design is taught in school. The mm -hmm. way you were taught is it, that, that it's product-driven. It's about materials, yes. it's about spaces. And let's contrast it a little bit with the entire foundational discipline of Nina in FinTech, where everything is driven in, in a field that's so much driven by technology. Nina's Talino Labs creates uh, solutions based entirely on customer needs, which is what you're saying in reality, in interior design, you can't go to a customer, right, and start saying, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is the, this is the materials mm -hmm. we're going to use. You have to start with getting the customer to tell the story of how their, what their yes. issues are, what their desires are, what their whims are. It, 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 it has everything to do with empathy, but yes. and yet you're not taught that in school. So when I think uh, from a systems perspective about what might be uh, – an innovation space for the future of design, interior design, I would probably not look so much at uh, materials, the product side of it. And I would look at, are we creating interior designers who are real human-centered design thinkers? Because it's not just your story that I hear. I hear, I do have quite a bit of friends who are in interior design and, uh, some do it better than others, but the ones yeah. I happen to, to, to also detect that they are all very good storytellers and story mm -hmm. listeners. They have the ability to draw stories out of people. And I think it's these stories that provide context and, and background for the architectural uh, mm -hmm. specifications that they end up drawing and implementing. No? And yet it seems yeah. to be so lacking empathy, human connection as a discipline, you know, because you can't just snap your finger and become good at empathy. Like everything else yes. takes practice, no? Interesting. Um, uh, so thanks for sh sharing that. Maybe Nina, in, in your space, um, mm -hmm. making this real in the last 10 minutes that we have, um, what, what is a, a glaring gap that, that you would like to attack? when you look at the space that you're in, where you think mm -hmm. if we attack this, we would solve a lot of problems in the area of fintech. Anything, anything at all, yeah. Okay, well, just very briefly, the reason why Talino Venture Labs was set up as a venture studio, um, which means we build many startups at the same time, is because we believe that the gaps are so huge, no single fintech can do it alone. We have to build many solutions across the planet. Because imagine, even the U.S., has 68 million unbanked or underbanked adults just in the US. But, and that's already a developed country. So what more, you know, in other continents, in other countries? So we have to develop many fintechs working together, really trying to serve the underserved. It's not just about online payments or e-commerce, but how about people on the fringes? What services do they need? How do we give them financial access um, in ways that can scale? And what? Ca how can we learn from each other around the globe? So I think those are the spaces that are ripe for innovation. So as I'm listening to you, uh, Nina, I'm, I'm, I'm extrapolating something, again, very systemic, sort of like what we uh, extracted from Ken's story, which is that if there is so much opportunity, gaps, problems to solve in the area of fintech, even in advanced markets like the U.S., you know, the thing with innovation is innovation does not innovate itself. Innovation mm -hmm. requires yes. innovators, just yes. like interior design. It's, I, think it's oh, yes. more obvious, I think it's more obvious in, in interior design and architecture. Interior design mm -hmm. requires interior designers. Yeah. Architecture yeah. requires architects. Right. And, and if we're not bringing up generations 
of architects and interior designers. We're not gonna get interior design and architecture done. We don't seem to have that kind of thinking in the field of innovation, in fields like fintech. If you want to solve more problems across the board in fintech, you can't attack fintech itself. You've got to bring up and nurture a generation of innovators who are capable, if you throw them this problem in fintech or here or there or in interior design, they can think their way through it. And they will think their way through it, not by talking about blockchain or AI, but by Mm -hmm. starting with a customer. Right? Mm-hmm. I, I think this is a fundamental flaw, yeah. no matter. There's, there was a, uh, uh, a poll earlier on, the future of what is your most favorite, the future of what. Now, regardless of the future of what, if we have a glaring hole in interior designers, architects, and true innovators who have empathy, we're never gonna, we're gonna, we're never gonna innovate at scale. Yes. Yeah, oh. yeah. yeah. Okay, now I'm getting a barrage of questions that I, I have to... Where is uh, Tresha? I'm going to feel this, okay, uh, from our chat box. Uh, what are your thoughts on the evolution of uh, Filipino urban communities? Do you think a functional community design is possible in the near future? Uh, that's that, Obviously, that's for Ken. Ah. Uh. Sorry, what was the question again for the so function? The question is that from Trisha, no? What are your yeah. thoughts on the evolution of a Filipino urban communities? Specifically, when it comes to functional community design, is it possible in the near future? I'm not sure exactly what functional community design means. Yeah, I don't know that either. So um, I think that is possible. Uh, Sorry, I can't really answer this question because I'm not an uh, urban planner, but I, my, my, my area of expertise in is in interior design. But I think that is possible, whatever uh, she's asking about. So, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, 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 if we had more time, I would venture <laughs> deeper into this and maybe, uh, but we have to put that question aside and move on mm-hmm. to another question from the same person, I'm assuming, Trisha also. This time for oh. Nina. For Nina. Mm-hmm. Do you have plans, Nina, on forming partnerships with local governments mm-hmm. in rolling out these fintech apps? Several communities can definitely benefit from these. Yeah. What's your view on distribution? Because this is essentially a question of distribution. You're creating the solutions, mm-hmm. how do you distribute them. And what's your what's your uh, view of partnerships with with LGUs or for that matter any kind of other distribution? Uh, mechanisms oh yeah i mean it's a great question thank you uh we all at alino we always work with private public sector partnerships so another example i can so i i shared with you earlier relief agad which we built in partnership with the dswd and usaid and volunteers hordes of volunteers just to get it up and running in time for the ayuda distribution right to digitize it and um, make it more transparent so that's one we have another regulatory tech startup called unawa that just recently closed a five-year deal with the municipality of Taytay, Palawan to digitize, you know, all the travel, like travel documents and travel clearances to be able to enter the province, um, the fees that you pay. So that was an, that's an example of an LGU partnership. But uh, we were also able to do that because we won an ADB challenge um, that allowed us to do the pilot. So again, it's the power of private part, uh, public partnerships. So we will always be open to these partnerships. I guess it's really a matter of framing in a way that makes it sustainable, right? Sustainable beyond whoever is in power. And it should really be for the people. Yeah, no, um, yeah, power to the people. Uh, it's election time. So, um, but I think that's a useful rubric no, for those of us who are trying to spread our solutions. Partnership with government, whether it's national government or local government, is really useful if you have a power, if you build a powerful solution, because you don't have to build the distribution. Local government and national government, in theory, has the distribution network. No? So that's one mm-hmm. way to content versus distribution. Okay, we got three minutes left. Um, and in those three minutes, I'd like to get parting shots from each of our two Pechakuchars, Pecha uh, uh talents, no? Um, and uh, what your parting shots, uh, what would you, what, what would your most meaningful invitation be? Your invitation be to our uh, uh, guests in the audience today in terms of 
uh, your respective spaces, which you're obviously very passionate about, how do they participate in what you're doing? Do uh, I start? Nina, Nina, Nina. Okay. Yeah. okay. So, well, one, uh, please, uh, please visit talinolabs.com. You'll see uh, a lot of areas in which you can participate, either um, through a career or by investing in Talino. But really, my parting shot is, as designers in whatever space, I invite everybody to build a people-centered future. I think that's the most we can hope for, and that's our hope for everybody. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I'm yes. gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna twist the uh, question a little bit for Ken. Ken okay. of Iloilo, who's basically in Makati right now. Yes. Um, I think you, you brought up a very poignant um, uh, piece of drama that people in the province would still turn to Manila, no? Yes. And maybe yes. you can maybe you can skew your invitation to our audience along those lines. So that after all, who will understand the needs of people in of customers in Iloilo in, 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 in more? Mm. Is it the interior designer from Manila, or is it your neighbor in Iloilo? Uh, what's your invitation to our audience? Uh, yeah, I, I think we really did uh, the organization, the Philippine Institute of Interior Design, uh, Interior Design Panay Chapter, did their part in spreading awareness when it comes to uh, the. The presence of interior designers in Iloilo. In Iloilo, it's just that that we need to. Uh, my my take on this is, uh, it's not enough yet currently because uh, there are uh, there are other profession that is known to do uh, our scope, and uh, I believe the interior design in Iloilo is creative and uh, the future is creative for Iloilo, and. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe maybe that's it. Uh, I, I'm. Yeah, maybe that's it. Uh, you were you were coming in and out, Ken. But uh, maybe I'll leave it on this because um, I, I listening to Ken and having empathy for Ken. Yeah. And, uh, I would put it this way, no. If I'm in Iloilo and I want something built interior design, my tendency, yes, would be to to look towards Manila, Imperial Manila, yeah. which has all the answers, right? But think about it. Really think about it. If you're the principal, the customer in Iloilo, you, know, mm -hmm. you get somebody from Manila, they're gonna probably look at you and think at you. You're you're just another customer from the province. Whereas yeah, if yeah. you get somebody from Iloilo, they're gonna treat you like royalty because you're their province mate, and they understand your context so much more. The humanity, the empathy for what yeah. is life in Iloilo, what is you know, the, the Ilongo uh, context more. And I think if there's one thing that I take away from our session today is that interior design, just like fintech, just like any field of innovation, and that's what interior design is. Because when I hire somebody to do interior design for my home, I want innovation. I don't want something that was intent that's in 200 other houses to be in my house, right? Well, unless you're that kind of customer, then you can, you know. But typically, you want something that's for yourself. And in order to get that, you can't get somebody who is high and mighty, who has all the answers, mm -hmm. because they, all, they know about all the products and how to use spaces. You've got to get somebody who will listen to you and connect mm -hmm. with you and empathize and have empathy for your context and your realities. And then you build from there. So I do want to make a case for interior design in the future of interior design in fill in the blank, wherever you are. In this case, Iloilo or yeah. wherever you are, right? Yeah. And um, for Nina, um, again, the future of fintech is not the technology. I think mm -hmm. that's right. The future of fintech is in understanding the human problems and the human beings yes. that you're solving for. The technology part, correct me if I'm wrong, Nina, is easy. It's, I mean, it's it's a tool, right? It's but who are you solving it for? And what problem are you solving? And have you solved it? That's the puzzle. Who are you solving it for? What are their real problems? Yeah. It's rarely the case that the technology is the puzzle. Because if the technology is a puzzle, you're in a very different game. But mm -hmm. if humanity and the problem is the puzzle, 
then a lot more of us can solve it. I think on that note, I want to, again, toast uh, to our two Pecha Kucha uh, uh, leaders, yes. to call you, uh, and uh, thank our audience for joining us, uh, and um, wish all of us a human-centered design thinking future, wherever or whatever industry we were in. Nina and Dr. Ken, Kayla, the rest of our uh, organizers, maraming salama. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thank you. Cheers. I'm also doing a virtual cheers from where I am. Cheers. And you know, Andre, I don't think I could have said it any better. What emerged for me from that discussion, that chat, the Q&A session, is at the heart of their innovations, Nina's and Dr. Ken's, it's really design thinking and a human-centered approach where they challenge assumptions, they think about the users, and they redefine the problems at hand. And I cannot commend the both of you enough for that. And earlier in the morning session, we were talking about pakikipag kapwa or kapwa sharing of self, and it's connecting ourselves with others. And I also think and believe that's what Andre was saying earlier. It's about empathy and sharing stories and knowing people at a deeper level than them just being statistics or data. With that said, I hope the three of you can stay on screen as we bring on our Executive Director from the Science Center of the Philippines. Let's have E.D. Ria Matute join us for a group photo. Hi, hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Great Good session. Afternoon. Thank you for sharing. I know. Thanks for having us, Ria. Always, Long always. <laughs> It's I know there's pleasure. still so much to say and process and unpack from that discussion, but if we can look at our cameras right now and put on our widest, most genuine smiles, let's smile for a quick photo op. And I know we're going to do it one more time. All right, perfect. So again, Andrea. Um, Dr. Ken and Nina, thank you so much. Idiria, we support all of your projects and everything you do. We rally behind it. So thank you very much, and we're excited to move on to the next portion of our program. All right. So to all our guests, I'd just like to remind you that we do have a poll questions still up, and I'm going to read it again. So please make sure you log in your answers. And for the Facebook poll, our question is, which sector's future are you most curious about? We have four choices. It's food, fashion, creative industries, and healthcare. So again, the poll question is, which sector's future are you most curious about? Is it the food, fashion, creative industries, or healthcare section? So whatever you feel to be true, whatever you believe, just go ahead and log in those answers for our poll, and we will review the answers in a while. So again, thank you so much to our speakers. Super interesting and insightful discussion. And right now, I would like to thank our partners as well for making design features. The future is now possible. So let me acknowledge them. A big, big thank you to Adobo Magazine, to British Council, HK Waltz, Scooney Projects, Hazen Coral, and the Department of Trade and Industry Export Marketing Bureau, or the DTI EMB. Again, Madam, good salamat. That's how we say it here in Baholod. Thank you so much. All right, while we're prepping for the next session, why don't we have another poll? You know, this is a great way to get to know you guys, albeit virtually. I do love having this interaction with you all. So, our poll question is What does the future hold for exhibitions? The choices are A, hybrid is the way to go, B, Back to fully physical exhibitions, please, with an exclamation point, or C, all roads lead to digital. So again, our poll question is, what does the future hold for exhibitions? Do you believe that hybrid is the way to go? Or are you a firm believer that being back to fully physical exhibitions is how we should do it? Or do you, um, are you in the mindset that all roads lead to digital? So three options, please log in your answers and we will pull up your results later on. So place your vote and we'll get back to the results during our fireside chat. Okay, so related to our poll question, our next session is a virtual exhibition. 
I'd just like to ask, and please feel free to sound off in the comment section, who else misses going to art museums and galleries? I know I have. This is one of the things I should have answered during our um, kamustahan earlier, <laughs> what we missed pre-pandemic. So, when was the last time you went to an art museum, a gallery, or an exhibition? For sure, it's been a while. We're, so, we're going to bring the experience right to your screens with Disconnect. Art Beyond Borders, presented in partnership with HK Walls and Scooney Projects. Our presenters will be Nicole Scooney, Director of Scooney Projects, and Jason Dembski, co-founder of HK Walls. Nicole is an art dealer and director of Scooney Projects, a collaborative platform with bases in London and Hong Kong, dedicated to promoting contemporary art and cross-cultural exchange between East and West. Previous to the launch, of Scooney Projects, Nicole was the director of Scooney Art Gallery, one of Asia's most influential art venues, pivotal in the development of a generation of Chinese contemporary artists and a prestigious hub of the Hong Kong art world. Jason is a designer, maker, and curator based in Hong Kong. His work bridges the disciplines of art and architecture. Jason directs his own design studio and is one of the co-founders of HK Walls. Jason has taught at the University of Hong Kong, City University of Hong Kong, and the University of St. Joseph in Macau, where for three years he led the Design Build Pavilion Studio, conceiving and constructing temporary pavilions on the public waterfront in Macau. Nicole will take us on a virtual experience of this disconnect, followed by a fireside chat with the creators of this exhibit, Nicole and Jason. So Nicole, the floor is all yours. Hi, Jason. Hello. Hi, thanks for having us. Um, Jason and I were having a private little laugh because I saw everyone was drinking. <laughs> <laughs> but Jason's in Hong Kong and I'm in London, so I'm, I'm on my coffee. I don't know if you've got your drink. <laughs> I've got my tea. <laughs> um, so to give you all an idea about what this project was, uh, 2020, we wanted to invite 10 street artists to take over a London Victorian house, which was set to, uh, to be renovated. And, you know, when our idea started, the pandemic hadn't been quite global yet. So we didn't realize the obstacles that we would face. So as we decided to go ahead, um, we suddenly realized that we'd have to work on this project remotely. So I think, you know, really we came up with a lot of obstacles and we had to come up with some solutions um we we opened the show in july and really the the message that we wanted to give at a time of difficulty was to innovate uh to collaborate um and to inspire so i we can talk about some of the production problems we had or the design problems because obviously jason and i were in hong kong uh the space was in london we had 10 artists that we wanted to work with, uh, six of which weren't actually in London. So because of travel restrictions, we had to be quite innovative in how we created an immersive experience. Um, we also wanted to reach obviously to an audience. And I think London at the time was under lockdown. So not knowing how we could first actually design and produce the show, but as well as get people to the exhibition. Uh, so we turned to technology. Um, and we also wanted to find ways to communicate and create a dialogue. So ways in which we did that was through a virtual reality show, which I'll show you in a minute. And we also did uh, quite a few programs. So we had some interviews with live, uh, live interviews on IG. We created, I don't know if you had that in the Philippines, but coloring books became quite a fad. So we created some coloring books with some of the artists. And um, we actually encouraged people to download the, uh, the free coloring books, color them in, submit it. And then we created a wall of fame, which we'll show you in the tour. And then we also created a, a digital catalog as well, which was quite informative. So I think actually maybe we can start the show, yeah? 
So we'll start with the London. So basically, once we did the London exhibition, we then brought it over to Hong Kong. But let me share my screen with you. Give me a second. So I hope you can see my screen. Can you see the screen? I can see it. Okay, great. Um, so I don't know for you watching if you've ever experienced this type of uh, virtual reality tour. We used Matterport as our platform. So it's quite interesting because you know, we wanted to really capture the textures and the feeling of the building. Uh, there were some limitations to it, but there are options which I love, like this doll's house. So you can actually see the whole space. So this was part of the Victorian house, which we took over with the 10th Street artists. By the way, out of the 10 artists, six, six of them were unable to, to come to London. So we had to be quite innovative in how we showed their works. You also have a floor plan uh, where you can go to each floor. So it's quite a fun little model that you can play with really. Um, I think what we'll do is I'll take you on a little tour. So this is Mr. Sens. Uh, he is a London-based street artist. And as you can see, the mural on the right actually changes color. Now that's something which we came up with um, as a way to show the different UV lights. If you look here, the artist wanted to create different, different color tones with the UV. So to be able to demonstrate each spot we changed the lighting color. So the artworks really, it's a response to the pandemic. Um, let's keep going. And so was the exhibition itself. This is Zoer. Zoer was actually based in Italy at the time. And uh, if he was in London, he would have created an installation with objects piled up on top of each other. This was a very technical um, and complicated process, which I think I'm going to hand over to Jason because I'm not really the technical person. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I think of, of all of the, the installations and the artworks, um, Zoer's installation was the most complex and um, required the most uh, high degree of precision. Um, what he what he created, because he couldn't physically go there, he wanted to pile up a number of objects in the space and uh, as kind of a barrier, as a kind of a metaphor of uh, how people are responding to the, to the pandemic. Um, but because he couldn't physically go there due to the restrictions, he decided he wanted to create what's called an anamorphic uh, illusion, um, where from one privileged point of view in the room, uh, the kind of the architecture of the room almost evaporates. Um, so what you're looking at right now is that specific point of view. Um, whereas if you move around from different, uh, different angles, the illusion distorts and stretches. Um, and we've done this by basically creating, uh, mapping or projecting, uh, these 3D objects onto flat surfaces. So it required a tremendous amount of back and forth uh, between uh, Zoer and I, um, between uh, myself and, or us and potential installers in London. Um, uh, I mean, it started with us measuring the whole room and then building a 3D model of the space and sending it to Zoer so he could then start to uh, construct and pile these objects up in three dimensions. Um, and then he basically, from that particular point of view, projects all of those objects onto the flat surfaces and exports these uh, basically wallpaper files. 
I think um, it's worth pointing out, Jason, if you yeah, don't mind ahead. that, you know, yeah, yeah. this is a Victorian house. So, of course, <laughs> none of the angles were straight. Everything was lopsided. Not just that, you had, I don't know if you can see, but you, um, the audience, but you, you've you got the, the fireplace as well and the chimney breast. So it was, it was very complicated. And then the other question was finding somebody to do it. <laughs> yeah. right it was yeah. so hard to find someone who had the skills and the technique to do it and luckily actually you know this is where i think collaboration and communication is key because one of the artists introduced us to a uk uh paste up artist um and and he's been doing it, I don't know, 30 years and even he said oh. this was one of the hardest things he's ever done <laughs> yeah yeah i mean he's he's used to doing a big really large scale uh paste up in the public oftentimes but usually it's just one piece side by side with the other piece this one is traversing floor wall ceiling fireplace wall uh, trimmings um and so it really took a, a really high degree of precision um that i don't think we could have achieved with anyone else yeah and remotely <laughs> yeah yeah his name's subvertiser if you want to check him out yeah um Okay, so I think, should we move to the next room? Sure. Um, so next up is um, Iran two Iranian brothers who are based in New York. Um, their names are Icy and Sot. And, you know, part, part of the, the exhibition was to integrate the house as well. Um, so one of the things we did was we sent a whole uh, list of items that had been left by the previous owner for example, the table, which you can see. And uh, so we gave the list to the artists and we said, look, you, you can't come to London. So one way of overcoming that obstacle is to send items from the house to you. And this will come up throughout um, the tour. So these artists, I find they were very innovative and they were just very quick as well in, in the way they solved the problem. So they chose this table, um, which in fact flips up and down. This is called socialism versus capitalism. And it's looking at the issue of food and access to food. Uh, and rather than sending them the table, they, I think within a week on Facebook market in New York, they found a replica um, with the two flaps. So they were able to create the crockery and that's, they just shipped us the crockery. So here you can see it's flipped down. And we then installed the plates and the cutlery onto the table in London. So again, there was a lot of back and forth. There was a lot of innovation, being smart and trying to think of how to overcome the obstacle of the pandemic, them not being physically in the house and being able to create an artwork that is part of the house. Um, and for the virtual tour itself, what we did was we, um, yeah, so we we made it so that there are different spots and you could actually see the tables flapping up and down. So normally I think Matterport is quite static. Um, yeah. So we tried to innovate wherever we could to make it a bit bit more different and a bit more unique. Yeah, generally, generally the, they would tell you, leave everything exactly the same, don't adjust anything. Um, but we wanted to really show the 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 change that was possible, um, and so by moving from different points of view, you see the table um, and its two configurations. Yes, yeah, so that this is actually a very good example. Um, you've actually got this is Ida Wilde. She's a London-based artist, so she was one of the the few artists that was in London, and she was able to create her installation. And she used UV light as well. So as you just saw we flipped between the UV light on and off uh, to try and create a less of a static experience, uh, just to show you again. Uh, we also used a 360, let me show you here, we used a 360 um, option. So she had also worked in two very claustrophobic rooms and she covered it up uh, with her own wallpaper. So this wallpaper, for example, is it's based on a London design uh, called Damascus. You can see the shape here. 
And she used emojis because emoji is, of course, an international language that everyone can understand. So she used emojis to explain her story about the pandemic. So you can sort of get a sense and a feel um, of how claustrophobic it is in here. Blood, sweat and tears and fears. I feel like that was quite a good way to sum up um, the process of doing this exhibition. And I know there was the poll question, which I think is really interesting, which I wanna talk about, because of course, here we're visiting a show virtually. We were actually able to show when we opened up, London had just uh, come out of lockdown. So, you know, this virtual was really trying to overcome the obstacle at the time of not being able to visit, not just ourselves, but audience. Um, another really important thing we feel is like engagement with the community. So Ida had created a, a workshop, a neighborhood a neighborhood workshop where she invited her neighbors to create posters to express their feelings, uh, not just about the pandemic, um, but various other issues as well. So you can see this is a very small room and I hope you get a sense of how claustrophobic. So if we go back out. So you can see here we're walking through curtains. Um, technically, so here you have the curtain closed. This was quite an issue as well, wasn't it, Jason? Yeah, yeah. Um, when when Matterport scans the room, it takes uh, it, it analyzes the three D objects and um, basically creates those objects in the three D model, and then that um, is overlaid with the photo realism that you're seeing. Um, but the problem with this particular curtain on the stair is that it, it kept creating it as a physical object and we couldn't walk past it in the model. It was basically building a wall in place of the curtain. So you, wouldn't, you weren't able to bypass the curtain. Um, so we had to kind of work with the, with the, the scanner slash photographer who was, who was documenting the space um, to rescan the room uh, a number of times um, to try to figure out how to get past it. Um, and the solution ended up being that as you move closer, the curtain actually pulls to the side um, so that you can, you can, this scan then allows Matterport to realize there's actually nothing there. Um, and yeah, allows us to go it, up the stairs. It seems like a very simple solution, but I remember <laughs> at the time it was really quite, um, yeah, time consuming. Um, yeah, I would say it was the, stare, one, I thought maybe not. <laughs> one of the first of many issues. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we'll keep going up the stairs now, just to tell you, I didn't want to show the audience everything um, because I want you guys to explore it yourself afterwards. Uh, you know, it's up on our website. I'll give you the information later. Uh, but just to give you a little bit of backstory about this piece. So as I mentioned, a lot of the artists weren't in London. So Adam Neat, he was in Brazil. He's a UK artist, but he's now based in Brazil. And, um, you know, how could he create artworks that was part of the house? So what we actually did was the canvas he painted on, which you're looking at here, is part of uh, an original curtain in the house from the previous owners. So what we did was we packed up the curtains and we shipped them to him in Brazil. It took us two attempts, by the way. And then he then created his artwork on it. And it's it's really talking about isolation during the pandemic. Um, I think you can feel that sort of angst in his character. But we were able to then, you know, make his artwork really part of the house by shipping items, which we found in the house. Um, there are some other curtains as well, which he created up the stairs. Then this is something, so before we were talking about the curtains and Matterport and glitching, you know, having a physical object. So here you see, you know, this was another thing we had to come up to. That was the door uh, open. And then we wanted to show these doors. So these doors are another quite fun, interesting story. Uh, Vils is street artist based in um, Lisbon in Portugal. Keeping in mind, this is all during lockdown. So he has done in the past a series of carvings on doors. And we wanted to give the illusion that he was in this house having created 
and carved on the doors. So what was our solution? Our solution was actually to uninstall the doors, truck them to him in Lisbon. He then carved on them in his studio. We then trucked them back to London and reinstalled it into the space. Um, and I often joke because after this, we'll show you the Hong Kong uh, part of the show. These doors and a lot of these artworks have probably traveled more than anybody during the pandemic because later we then transported them to Hong Kong and reinstalled them as doors as well. Then we have Heracut. They are a German uh, duo based in Berlin. So looking at this room, you know, would you think they had actually been in the space creating this artwork? Oh, let me go back to that. Uh, so again, you know, they were quite innovative and smart. They actually chose cardboard. So these artworks are made from cardboard, which made it easy to ship flat pack. Uh, HK Balta, which is a pun on Hong Kong walls, <laughs> is, the, is the, how tall was he? He was over three meters. He's a, yeah, he's about three meters, 3.5 maybe. Yeah. yeah, so he came in, I believe it was nine pieces, uh, which we then built. Um, both in Hong Kong and in London. And again, we incorporated found objects in the house, like the carpet, the table, the armchair, uh, to create more of an immersive experience. And we, so, you know, before I was talking about collaboration and innovation, how important it is to have other players, because I think the more people that collaborate, the more ideas you have and thinking out of the box. So it was actually photographer Ian Cox um, who came up with this idea of projecting. So you can see here is Heracut's logo. They're also known for their um, quotes and texts. So we actually projected this onto the wall and had our project manager, Tom, who has an artistic flair to imitate. Um, this room was loads of Zoom calls, WhatsApps, back and forth. Um, the artists even, I thought it was like an artist uh, secret. She even told Tom how to imitate her brush strokes in recreating uh, the quotes. So I think the result is really, um, it's very effective because it gives you the illusion that the artist had been in this room creating the artworks and installing when in fact they were all the way in Berlin and we were all the way in Hong Kong, managing it remotely. Um, so we're going to go up the stairs now. Oh, I wanted to show you this piece. Oops, this one, sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, the show must go on. I feel like that's quite a good uh, motto, if you like, for our project because you know, when we were discussing going ahead, as I mentioned before, the pandemic was happening, there were travel restrictions. It just seemed quite impossible that we could do this. Um, but at one point, you know, I discussed with Jason and the other co-founder, Maria, and I just said, you know what, we just, the show must go on. We should just do this and we'll just do it on the fly. Whatever obstacles we come across, we'll just try overcome. Um, so a lot of this was really trial and error. And that's why I love this piece, because this was an original curtain from the house. It was shipped to Brazil to Adam Leet. And he took that phrase from an email I sent to all the artists, you know, the show must go on. Uh, so this one just means quite a lot to me personally. So we'll keep going up the house. Jason, if you if I'm going too quick, let me know. I tend to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I think we, we might need to speed up. Okay, okay. Um, so there are two rooms, which I'm actually going to skip. One is David Bray and one is um, Alex Faxo. And I wanted to skip it because I want you guys, the audience, to explore yourself. So quickly then, I'm going to move on quickly. This was the Wall of Fame room, which I had mentioned before. Um, there were, you know, the coloring books. We asked people to submit through... Sorry. We asked people to submit through um, through Instagram, for example, and then we would print 
and put them up so that people were able to be a part of the exhibition itself and feel like they were involved um, to try create more of a community. Okay, then, so I think one thing next we can sort of talk about is Matterport and the limitations. And the reason I want to bring this up is we had actually, you know, I talked about trying to create something more immersive and interesting. We had actually created sounds on top um, of each artwork. And not just that, we had also created a hunt. Um, I'm going to stop sharing, Jason. You can maybe share the video. Sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, we worked with a developer actually based in Manila um, to overlay um, and kind of add more elements on top of um, the basic Matterport um, capabilities. Uh, let me just share this my screen with you. Uh, okay. Um, so what we created uh, to kind of add an element of uh, intrigue and to kind of force people to kind of explore the whole house um, it was we created this hunt. Um, and so by clicking on the upper right hand corner of the screen, um, you would engage this hunt to find one of the artist's little sculptures. These sculptures were um, kind of placed all over the house, kind of site specifically. Um, and this hunt allows you to basically go through and find each uh, find each of the sculptures. And hopefully are you you can hear this. Um, can you hear the sound? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, on top of the the hunt, we also added an element of sound. So as you're in different uh, positions in the house, um, different sounds would be would be keyed up. Um, yeah, this one, you can hear them texting each other. Can you, can you hear it now? Yeah. Um, but so the each, it really helped to kind of paint the atmosphere uh, and set the set the scene for for each each area and space. Um, and so here's another one of the, the sculptures. Uh, there's to total of 21. Um, but unfortunately, Unfortunately, um, there's been some recent updates to Matterport, and we've lost uh, this part of the uh, interaction. Um, we're hoping to get it back online soon. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> That's a limitation of tech. You have to constantly <laughs> keep up with it all. Yeah. Um, well, I think the Hong Kong one is a good one because that one's still got the sounds. So shall I, sh I'll share that now. Sure. Uh-huh, share screen. Okay. So this is the Hong Kong space. Um, and as we said, we added sounds on top. So what we did was after the London show, whatever was removable, we then brought with us to Hong Kong and created a different, uh, I guess, experience. You know, the design and the flow was different. This is in a 1950s, what they call a Tong Lao, like an old tenement building in Hong Kong. Um, the great thing was it was also three floors, like the exhibition. Sorry, hold on a sec. And we were able to sort of recreate a new experience and new flow. So I'm just going to start here. Um, this part I love. Just because that to me is so symbolic of that time. Uh, Zohar, I don't know if you can hear me because it's a bit loud, but bit Zohar, loud. He, had, he had recreated, he had actually created a sound specific sound bite to go with his illusion. Now, if you remember, this was in the London space. Um, so again, it was a lot of back and forth technicals, you know, the, the actual architecture of the building was different. So it's another process again, which we have to go to recreate that. Uh, 
Um, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna focus a bit more on the sound. So here's the paintings from Mr. Sens. So we wanted to create, you know, the idea of him being a street artist. He used spray cans to create his artworks. Um, so we actually worked together with the artist to pick the sounds. Again, I'm not gonna show you everything because we don't have time and I want you to explore yourself. This is David Bray, the smell of the sea in your nose. Um, it's this idea that, you know, at the time nobody could travel, everyone was stuck at home. Uh, this artist, he, these are actually mindscapes, the paintings. He wanted to, it was like an escapism. So he wasn't actually on the countryside painting. This was really from his imagination. Um, and then on the right, you see the sort of counting the days down about the pandemic. Then this Matterport or this VR is a more informative experience. So we actually included more details about each artwork um, and each artist as well. So we'll keep this name through. Uh, we went so far as to record sounds in the staircase to try and make it more immersive and more of the real experience. This is an artist called uh, Jaffa Lam. She's a Hong Kong based artist. So for the Hong Kong edition, we introduced four Hong Kong artists into the conversation about art during the pandemic. Uh, again, she created a specific soundscape um, and using UV lights, UV lights, you know, it, it sort of relates to the cleansing, the cleaning, sterilizing, talking about the virus and the germs. This is Isaac Cordell. This artwork here is called News of the Day. And it's talking about how, especially in the beginning of the pandemic, the uh, we're all obsessed with warning, information and it sort of feeds into the negative psychology. The so we decided to have a news report as part the of the sound. We need to reach a sustainable situation where we have so this is a sound bite from a BBC clip. Without shutting down our lives entirely. So the design and flow was really important. Um, we wanted to create a journey, um, not just on the virtual reality, but the whole process we documented, we did photographs, we had videos there, it's all on our websites. Um, we were very informative on our Instagram as well, but it was really a way to communicate to people when people weren't able to travel. So you can see that is again, Heracut Room, uh, the duo from Berlin. There's HK Walls, or HK Balta even. Um, and then, so this was something else which I think I'm quite pleased and proud about. Because um, we had one artist called uh, Casey. Sorry about that noise, this is the artwork at the back. And it was actually a video, uh, video artwork called The Quarantine, an experimental film. So the question was, you know, how do we show that in a virtual reality? tour so working with a developer elastic teams who is actually based in the philippines um and sadly unwell can't join us he helps us to develop i guess i don't know jason is sort of like embedded on top yeah so you can even you know look around walk around but you can still experience the actual film itself and something else that we worked on, because I know we're going to get short of time, is we actually had two locations. So what we created was a time lapse through uh, one of Hong Kong's busiest districts called Causeway Bay. So the, the exhibition was split across two venues in Hong Kong. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if I should start from the beginning. <laughs> I love that. Okay, here we go. So this is something that we added on top and developed. And it's jumping, it allows our viewers, our audience to jump between the two spaces. Um, and then, because we were quite happy with the result of Casey's video in the other space, we then decided to put up um, a short vignette. 
time, which we had COVID virus pandemic. That's the warning from the head of the World Health Organization. Um, so I guess really in conclusion, you know, we came up with a lot of obstacles. Uh, we overcame them through communicating, collaborating, and using technology. Um, and yeah, I think the, it really, we just wanted to share this journey uh, with a wider audience and just how did we come up with those constraints. So I'm gonna stop sharing now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think, I mean, one, one of the interesting questions actually, which was brought up was whether you can experience art in person or virtually. And I feel like that is something which we, you know, which we question ourselves and I constantly question. And as much as we tried our best to create an immersive experience with a virtual world, it's never the same as seeing the originals. <laughs> I think you might agree with that. Well, I never saw the London in person, so. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I was very lucky and I managed to fly last minute and just go see it very quickly. <laughs> But yeah, I think with all the hours I spent in that in that model, I, I feel like I know the house pretty intimately. <laughs> Jason, Nicole, thank you so much. And when I say you did fantastic work, it is an understatement. And the rise of COVID-19 with the current and the ongoing pandemic, it's really forced cultural institutions to explore alternative digital spaces within online ex exhibitions and arise in virtual reality and I think it was also discussed and highlighted that now it's possible to reach beyond traditional structures and reach different audiences and with this connect you showed us how immersive the experience can still be but you're right Nicole it really is different to see it in person and to be there physically mm. but right now this is what we have and we are so grateful for the creative minds that you guys have being able to turn it into something possible for me all the way here in Bacolod, you know, which is so far <laughs> from where you guys are. Well, I hope you get a chance to explore it. <laughs> I know, and I, I look forward to it. Now, we've received some questions from the Design Center inbox and across our platforms. But before we begin our fireside chat, I'll call on our moderator for today's session, Butch Karungay. Butch is a creative entrepreneur, design advocate, and community crusader who is passionate about the possibilities in harnessing and optimizing the intrinsic creative potential in his hometown of Cebu. So another person from the province, I love it. He is the chief creative officer at Zai Design Hive, the latest incarnation of the country's pioneering fashion jewelry exporter, which has since expanded to other creative disciplines, and chief reinvention officer of District 32 at Mactan Cebu, a leading operator of commercial concessions at the Mactan Cebu International Airport. Welcome to the IDC stage, guys. Hello. Hey, guys. Hi, good. Nice good to meet you. Good afternoon. Good evening. Is it is it is it <laughs> afternoon there already, Nicole? Is it still morning? It's still morning, 1045, hence the coffee. So no Baileys in the coffee. No Baileys. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the chat segment of the Arts Beyond Borders sesh. Again, I'm Butch, and I'll be moderating this afternoon's talk with Nicole and Jason. Thanks again for that curated tour, guys. It's amazing how you're able to leverage tech and deploy logistical sorcery to imagine how an art exhibit can be staged and be super innovative about it despite all the constraints. Uh, I think it was mentioned earlier that you know the role of art has really been questioned a lot during um, this entire ordeal, ordeal, whether artistry and creativity are still in such essential considering all the other challenges facing the world at the moment. However, many advocates um, would tend to argue that not only is art a great coping mechanism to deal with a multitude of emotions that everyone is barraged with, but con it continues to be an important means for much needed self-expression. More importantly, art and creativity have been identified as essential tools for recovery as the world rebuilds, hopefully better from this pandemic. 
And I'd like to think that all of your learnings from this initiative are a testament to that. Um, so we don't have much time. And I Sorry. do have a few <laughs> prepared questions in addition to whatever our audience may decide to field. So um, let's begin our chit chat with Nicole and Jason. Um, considering the complex nature of these exhibits, this first question may be a bit tough, but can you please describe this initiative in three words in addition to the blood, sweat, tears, and fears <laughs> from the exhibit. See, I was actually like paying attention. <laughs> um, I've got my three. I'm curious to know what yours are, Jason. Uh, mine would be innovate, collaborate, and inspire. Um, yeah, yeah, those are good. Um, I mean, I, I wanted to go with the show must go on, <laughs> but <laughs> that's five. <laughs> well, well, it's one thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it was definitely such a big learning curve and learning process. And I think what you said, Butch, about, you know, the importance of art, it's true. We wanted to create a place of refuge, um, somewhere where people could go and see that everyone is, you know, experiencing the angst and the insecurities and all those emotions that came with the pandemic. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that art, you know, art has its role and its importance in that. Is that the reason why you guys chose to stage in a house? Um, um, the house kind of happened. Or in both houses, actually. Actually, actually okay. the house came first, really. Ah, um, okay. This was a space which, you know, I came across and it was set to renovate. And the idea that it just seemed like a missed opportunity not to work with such a unique space um, and to introduce artworks into it. And I've always loved street art, and that's why we worked with Jason um, and HK Walls and Maria. Uh, they're such great advocates for street art in Hong Kong. So, you know, sort of connected the dots, and that's how it happened. Fantastic. Um, yeah, and uh, taking off on that, um, you guys have both confirmed that, you know, one great thing that did come out in this pandemic is that it's ushered in a wave of hyper collaboration that we've never seen before. Um, so can you please talk about the genesis of how the Shoni Hong Kong Walls collabo started and you know, how it progressed? Um, Jason, I mean, I guess organic again. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think it was uh, one of the better collaborations I've ever worked on. Um, we <laughs> each brought together very different, very different things. Uh, you know, we brought a lot of different um, skills to the table. Um, a lot of different connections and um, yeah, it just, it worked out really well um, despite all of the, <laughs> the, the obstacles we had. Um, I think positive attitude helped too. <laughs> yeah. But we I were think, introduced by a mutual friend. Fantastic. Yeah. So but but I, you always have it in mind to stage in both cities? Yeah, that was something okay. which was important to me because Hong Kong was my home. Mm -hmm. um, and wanting to sort of bridge between the two uh, felt quite important and introducing Hong Kong artists into the conversation for the Hong Kong edition as well. Right. Because it's a but global must, pandemic. Yeah, but that must have been like exponentially challenging though, right? Which part? From <laughs> the logistics, everything. <laughs> but were there any commonalities um, and I would say, and maybe differences um, in your experiences in London and Hong Kong? Um, yeah, I mean, they were okay, two very me. different experiences, right? Because yeah. one, we were working on completely remotely. Uh, you know, Jason and I were in Hong Kong. I had I actually laughed this morning because now I'm in London, Jason's in Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, the first project, you know, completely remotely from across the world. Uh, we had to communicate with the artists, not face to face, you know, using WhatsApp, Zoom calls. The Hong Kong one, we were actually in the location. Um, yeah, it was just quite different. And the, the, the spaces themselves were very different. So the way we designed it, you know, we had to redesign really and recurate the exhibition into the Hong Kong space. Um, so yeah, there were different elements, I think, to both. And how long did it take you guys to actually organize, say London first and then Hong Kong? I mean. <laughs> what? Uh, well, oh, what does that mean? Like? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. How many uh, months? Maybe? We, we, I think we had the first discussion. It must have been in, uh, I don't know, January or February. 2020. Of 2020. So that was pre-pandemic. 
it was well hong kong was already we were already starting to feel it you see and that was the interesting thing because by the time you know so there's months of like do we do it do we not do it how do we do it by april we decided let's let's go for it and that's when the panic the fear the uncertainty uh the lack of information started to happen across europe so at that point you know asia was already living it right um, so, I mean, quite honestly, I, I do think it was quite an amazing feat because we pulled off in a very short period of time, but we were able to do that with the help of many. Um, I mean, Butch, I think in total, Hong Kong, London, we had over 200 people working on this. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Not just us. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I can imagine. Um, okay. So, um, now let's talk about um, you know the virtual experience, and uh, you mentioned that you know it's while you guys have did an amazing job, it's really not quite the same. Um, what would you have done differently next time if you are if you are if you are compelled to do another virtual experience? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, for for me at at the moment in the current technology, I think we would still use probably use Matterport as the base because um, simply because it uh, provides such a photorealistic representation of the spaces, which is really um, uh, necessary when you want to convey the actual qualities of the artwork. Um, whereas, I mean, you're limited to only the number of points on the floor, the number of scans you take in each room. But um, if the other alternative would be to basically create the whole thing in a, a clean 3D model, and texture all of the surfaces, but then the lighting is all artificial. The surfaces textures aren't aren't really there. They're just mimicked, um, and you just don't get the same quality of, of of experience. It would allow you to to move freely through the space, but it, you wouldn't get the real uh, feel of the artwork. Um, yeah. So I think right now we would we would still do it in a similar way, but try to um, maybe improve on some of the add-ons and different things. And, but and maybe one, plan, plan more in advance. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, <laughs> that's always a medical part, right? <laughs> but, but, but once um, things really, once all restrictions are dropped and things uh, are back, are in the new normal, do you still see uh, a space for virtual exhibits such as these? I think so, yes. I mean, I think it really does help to, you know, cross cross boundaries and um you still want to reach to a wider audience so even when travel opens some people can't travel right some people don't have the privilege of being able to travel but still want to find inspiration and find right. new ideas or we can't be everywhere at the same time or where you're, not, you're having your exhibit so it can also be a timing issue and it's immortalized right our show is right. still online it's there yeah. right yeah. do you see any other opportunities aside from that um in terms of in terms of like you know reaching a larger audience um what? i think for me social media is quite a new obsession i feel like i'm a granny because i'm not very tech and i think you know there are just so many ways to reach out to an audience and really create dialogue i think dialogue is important and creating a conversation um that comes out of an exhibition you know that's that's i think that's also a very big opportunity which you know, we want to work on more too. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, so on that note, like, um, what kind of narratives do you think that are that you see evolving? Considering we all have, you know, the shared kind of traumatic experience that we've all had to live through. Um, what narratives are there? Do you think in the future that that's gonna, you know, evolve from all of this? Ooh, that's a very big topic, Butch. Um, <laughs> I mean, we may need some wine for this. Yes. Um, I think art, art for all is quite important to me. Um, I think it's really about equality, you know, that art isn't just for a certain group of people. It should really be for everybody and accessible to everybody. Uh, Jason, do you want to add to that? I, I mean, I, yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, you know, this, the internet is about sharing all sharing everything with everyone and making it, um, uh, accessible to everyone, and I think you know the, the more the technology improves, the the more accessible things will be. The cheaper technology becomes, the more accessible things will be. Um, yeah, I think I think it's it's 
these are just tools that are helping us to share with more people and get more people engaged. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, art democratization and actually design democratization is something that's very, very big to me. Um, I think it's somewhat uh, in peril because of the pandemic, especially in countries like the Philippines, because you know there's so much else that people are concerned about. But um, it was a trend that I thought was really gaining traction before this pandemic. Still accelerated in some ways in certain um, in certain aspects and in, in certain segments of society, but until technology is available to all and it is ubiquitous, then uh, you won't have that kind of democratization that we would all want to be at. Yeah. Um, yeah, so. Um, so what's next for you guys? What's next for Hong Kong Walls and Shani projects? Have you talked, have you pondered the next um, SNM session yet? Not yet, but I think we're we're very supportive of each other in our own projects, um, and always help each other out. Yep, absolutely. But for the time being, nothing concrete yet. Are you planning on going back to Hong Kong, Nicole, soon? Or I would love to, except for the three week uh, travel restrictions. Is it three weeks now? Three weeks. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And Jason, you've been stuck there the entire time. Yep, I th I think the last time I left was, I don't know, February of twenty twenty. <laughs> no, okay. might have been. I don't know. I've lost total track. It might be. It's definitely longer <laughs> Me than too. that. Me too. It's like you know, my, my passport is stamped with all these things from my house. So it's like you know, the, toilet, <laughs> the living room, the room. The kitchen, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so I think uh, <laughs> unless we have any more questions, I think that's it for this afternoon. Okay. Um, thank you again, guys. You know, uh, as a would you guys? Do you guys have any last thoughts for our audience? Um, no, I, I guess just that, you know, art is important, I think, for society and like, you know, just always be inspired and explore and learn more, I think is important. And hopefully, don't let obstacles stop you from doing anything. Um, just keep positive attitude, find a way to overcome. And hopefully, you know, we'll get to a better place. <laughs> <laughs> Every appendage crossed. <laughs> Jason? <laughs> Um, yeah, I was I was gonna say something similar. I think the obstacles um, make the projects better. Um, mm -hmm. Without any friction, there's yeah, it's not it's just not so interesting. So, I mean, I think yeah, anything is possible uh, as long as you <laughs> actually put some effort into it. Yeah, very true. So there you have it, guys. You know, art is indeed beyond borders, but with new tech and unprecedented hyper collabos, then so much is possible. Thank you once again for sharing your amazing journey, Nicole and Jason. We look forward to seeing what's next from both Shoni and Hong Kong Walls in the future, despite, because despite everything, the show must go on. Cheers. Thank you. Awesome talk, guys. And thank you for taking us on that virtual tour. It really is groundbreaking work. And relating it to the poll question we asked earlier, let me just repeat the question. We asked the audience and our guests, what does the future hold for exhibitions? We had three choices. It was either hybrid is the way to go, or B, back to fully physical exhibitions, please, with an exclamation point, or C, all roads lead to digital. So right now, we are going to flash on screen the results. So 60% of our audience members, they said that hybrid is the way to go, um, looking forward and into the future, 25% asked to have the full physical exhibitions back, please. Mm -hmm. And 15% said that all roads lead to digital. Now with hybrid exhibitions, I guess it's the merging of the physical and digital worlds that we've learned to appreciate and utilize even more during this pandemic. And it's using a mix of offline and online exhibitions to reach a broader audience. That's why we're able to enjoy the work that you put out, despite the fact that we're on different countries and continents even. So before you guys go, before you exit, of course, I'd like to bring back Ms. Ria Matuta here on screen so we could have a photo op with her. I'm sure she got excited and she has so much to talk about or discuss with you given the time. But I understand we may we may not have enough time anymore, so let's just have the photo up. There we go. <laughs> hi. <laughs> hi, hi. Thank you everyone for inspiring hey. us, no? 
Oh, thanks Despite for having the lockdown, us. <laughs> the longest lockdown. <laughs> yes, creativity continues. It perseveres. So right now, let's have our photo off. Let's look directly at our respective cameras, have our smiles on, and wait <laughs> for the camera effect sound. <laughs> Let's do one more. Great. Thank you so much. So once again, we extend our gratitude to you guys. Butch, um, Jason, and Nicole, thank you so much for taking us through that tour, for showing us Disconnect, and in the process, connecting us with your work and also some very real lived experiences during this pandemic. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Ms. Rhea. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. All right. At this point, I'd like to ask our audience to stick around because we're down to our last session for this evening. So I hope you're still with us. You're still tuning in and engaged because our next session will definitely make you think. But before I get ahead of myself, I'd like to once again extend my thanks to our partners. A big thank you to Adobo Magazine. British Council, HK Walls, Scooty Projects, Chasing Coral, and the Department of Trade and Industry Export Marketing Bureau, or the DTI EMB. Just thank you, thank you to all our partners. And as we are nearing the closing of day one of Design Features, the future is now, we'd like to remind our audience to enter the feedback form accessible through this QR code. There we have it on screen, so don't forget to use your mobile phones to scan it. And we'd love to hear your thoughts and your feedback about this first day of the International Design Conference with us. I'll just give you a bit more time to maybe scan that. The feedback form will serve as your confirmation to get your certificate after the sessions. Don't miss the last session for today. We've got a private session happening via Zoom. So it's very important that you register for that session for you to join. It will be a film showing of Richard Rivier's documentary entitled Chasing Coral at 8 p.m. Philippine time. So before the screening, Richard will join us for an intimate conversation about the film, how they came up with the campaign, about also about current issues, and generally what's happening to our oceans. You can chat and ask him questions and maybe open up ideas and solutions on the climate crisis. So be ready for that, guys. For now, we're taking a quick break while our team sets up our, our final virtual stage. So get some water, unless you'd prefer wine or a drink. Freshen up and meet us at Zoom at 8 p.m. See you guys in a bit.